George has done so much for this town. Please look after him. George has seemed extremely troubled recently. He is such a kind and generous man. So please, watch over his soul tonight. Oh Lord, please help my George. He's troubled. Very troubled, Lord. He's not the same, and I'm afraid he may do something dangerous. Please send him some hope. I need him home. Our babies need him home. I just saw a father storm out of the house in a rage. I hope he's back soon. Hello, Joseph. Trouble? Looks like we'll have to send someone down. A lot of people asking for help for a man named George Bailey. George Bailey? Yes. Tonight is crucial night. You're right. We'll have to send someone down immediately. Whose turn is it? That's why I came to see you, sir. See, it's that clockmaker's turn again. Oh, Clarence. Hasn't got his wings yet, has he? Well, we've passed him up right along, because, you know, sir, he's got the IQ of a rabbit. Yes, but he's got the faith of a child. Simple. Joseph, send for Clarence. You send for me, sir? Yes, Clarence. A man down on Earth needs our help. Splendid. Is he sick? No, worse. He's discouraged. It's exactly 10.45pm, Earth time. That man will be thinking seriously of throwing away God's greatest gift. Oh dear, dear, his life. Then, I have only an hour to dress. What are they wearing now? You'll spend that hour getting acquainted with George Bailey. Sir, if I should accomplish this mission, I mean, uh, might I perhaps win my wings? I've been waiting for over 200 years now, sir, and people are beginning to talk. What's that book you've got there? Oh, The Adventures of Tom Sawyer. Clarence, you do a good job with George Bailey, and you'll get your wings. Oh, thank you, sir. Thank you. Poor George. Sit down. Sit down? What are we- If you're going to help a man, you want to know something about him, don't you? Well, naturally. Of course, I- well, Keep your eyes open. See the town? Where? I- I don't see a thing. Oh, I forgot. You haven't got your wings yet. Now look. I'll help you out. Concentrate. Begin to see something? Why, yes. This is amazing. If you ever get your wings, you'll see all by yourself. Oh, wonderful! I wouldn't do it if I were you. Wouldn't do what? What you're thinking of doing. How'd you know what I was thinking? Well, we make it our business to know lots of things. Look, whatever you're selling, I'm not interested. Please, just leave me alone. No, you don't understand. I've, I've got a job to do here. I said, leave me alone. <sighs> this isn't going very well. I know, but you, you said this was going to be easy. He won't listen. I know, I know. If at first you don't succeed, blah, blah, blah. Have you ever read Tom Sawyer? What? Now, there was an industrious young man, and when the chips were down, he never lost hope. You remember why? Who cares? Because he kept thinking about others, George. Not about himself, but about all the folks who depended on him. You call me George? How do you know my name? Oh, I know everything about you. I've watched you grow up from a little boy. But how could you? I've never seen you before. You haven't needed to. Until now. Who are you? Clarence Oddbody. AS2. Oddbody? AS2? What's that, AS2? Angel. Second class. Now I know I've lost my mind. Well, not yet, but you're well on your way. Besides, it's... Ridiculous to think of killing yourself for a measly $8,000? How do you know that? 
I've been trying to tell you, George. I'm your guardian angel. Well, you look like the kind of angel I'd get. You saw the fallen angel. Say, what happened to your wings? I haven't won my wings yet. That's why I'm an angel second class. But you're going to change all that. I am? How? By letting me help you. The only way you can help me is to get 8,000 bucks before the clock strikes 12. Well, After that, my life turns into a pumpkin. Sorry, but we don't use money in heaven. Oh, that's right. I keep forgetting. Well, down here, you can't live without it. And truth be told, I'm worth a lot more dead than I am alive. Now, you mustn't say things like that. But besides, you don't know how much you're worth. Why, if it hadn't been for you, If it hadn't then... been for me, everybody I know would be better off. <sighs> my wife, my kids, my friends. Well, you sure have got a lot of friends. I'll say that for you. Why, do you know they've jammed up our airwaves for over an hour now? What do you mean? Prayers. When they're heartfelt, they're mighty, powerful missiles. And the ones for you. Why, they've lit up our entire celestial system. Why? How? Because you're such an important influence on so many lives, George. Always have been, and just like Tom Sawyer. Since when? Ever since that day that you saved your brother from drowning when he broke through the ice. I, I was 12. It was instinct. There were other boys there that day. Some of them older, better swimmers. But they didn't nod to their instincts. But he was my brother. I know, but what about Mr. Gower? When you saved him from ruin? That wasn't instinct. That was courage. Deep-seated, wrenched full of guts. Courage. But he had just received a telegram telling him his son had died. And he turned mean, through and through, from drowning his sorrow in the bottle. Remember? Hot dog! George, are you out there? I'm sorry, Mrs. Blaine, that medicine should have been there an hour ago. I promise you, it'll be over in five minutes. Where's Mrs. Blaine's box of capsules? Why didn't you deliver them? I, I couldn't. Why couldn't you deliver them? What kind of tricks are you playing, young man? Don't you know the Blaine boy is very sick? Mr. Gower, you're scaring me. You lazy loafer. Mr. Gower, you don't know what you're doing. You put something wrong in those capsules. What are you talking about? I know you're unhappy. You got that telegram today and it upset you. I understand that. But you put something bad in those capsules. I'm sure you did. How do you mean? Just look and see for yourself. I tried to tell you while you were filling the order, but you wouldn't listen. But just look at the bottle you took the powder from. It's not right. I swear it isn't. Oh, no. No. No! I won't tell anyone, Mr. Gower, I promise. I know what you're feeling. I'll never tell a soul. Hope to die, I won't. Oh, George. And you never did. That's remarkable. But he always cared for us kids. He gave most of us our first jobs. Well, he certainly never stopped caring about you. That's for certain. Dwight, do you remember that handsome suitcase he bought you when you thought you were finally heading off to college? But that was a thousand years ago. May you always use this in good health, George. What? How can I thank you, Mr. Gower? By graduation with honors. That would make us all very proud. Fat chance. Play your bat, little brother. I haven't got time. I'm off to my dance. How do I look? Like a goon in a penguin suit. Where's a funeral? That's enough, you two. You look very nice, Harry. And what do you think, Violet? Do I look good enough to eat? You look very handsome, Harry. We're all going to miss you, George. Thank you, Violet. Say, that's a nice dress you got on there. Wow, this old thing? Oh, it's just a hand-me-down, like Harry's. It's uh, very pretty, isn't it, George? What? The dress. Oh, the dress. Yeah, real nice, Violet. 
Well, I guess I better be going then. The dance starts another half hour. Say, why don't you drop by later on? I just might do that. Hope you do. Goodbye now. Want me to walk you over to the school? That won't be necessary. Take care, George. Yeah, you too, Violet. Say, Uncle Billy, where's Pop? He, uh, had to finish a special report for part of board meetings tomorrow. I thought when Pop put him on the board of directors, he'd ease up on us. I mean, what's eating that old money-grabbing buzzard anyways? Oh, he's a sick man, George. Sick in his mind, sick in his soul if he has one. Hates anyone who has anything he can't have. Hates us most, actually. Say, George, after you graduate, you wouldn't consider coming to work in the building alone, would you? Not me, Uncle Billy. Just the thought of spending my life cooped up in a, a shabby little office. Trying to work out how to save three cents on a length of pipe? I'd go crazy. No, not me. I want to do something big, you know? Something important. Well, your father and I think that in some way we are doing something important. Why, it's deep in the soul of a man to own his own roof, own his own walls, and sit beside a fireplace of an evening. And we think we're helping him get those things. Well, Bill, you gotta admit, this town is no place for any man unless he's willing to crawl to part of. Now, George here, he's got talent. We've all seen him. So, he needs to go on, get himself an education, and then... Get out of this town. Do you have any idea what you want to do, George? Yeah, sure. I mean, I want to build skyscrapers. Maybe even cities. It's been a dream my whole life. Still have to that first million before you're 30. Uh, I know. I'll set up a half that in cash. Well, we sure are going to miss you, George. I'm going to miss you too. That's for certain. Say, do you mind taking that to the house? I think I will drop in on Harry's dance. See how he's getting along. Take care, son. Yeah, you too. And you did, too. Remember? That was the night you met Mary Hatch. Oh, of course, you'd known Mary all your life. She grew up three or four years right behind you and was always there, tagging along until one of you boys noticed and sent her on away. That never discouraged her. Well, not her or any of the girls. They were all hooked on you, especially Violet and Mary. You just never took the bait until Harry's graduation party. And that was the night that you danced the Charleston all night with Mary Hatch until somebody tripped the lock on the moving gym floor and you all fell or jumped into the swimming pool. Oh yes, oh yes, oh yes, the big Charleston contest. <laughs> A genuine loving cup. Those not tapped by the judges will remain on the floor. Let's go! I'm not very good at this. Neither am I. Okay, what did we lose? What's the matter, Othello? Jealous? Did you know there's a swimming pool under this floor? And did you know that button behind you causes this floor to open up? And did you further know that George Bailey is dancing right over that crack? And I've got the key.
Can't you come out tonight? Can't you come out tonight? Buffalo gals, can't you come out tonight? And dance by the light of the moon. Hot dog, just like the church choir. Beautiful. You should have seen the commotion in that locker room. I had to knock down three people just to get the stuff we're wearing. I bet half the class jumped in that swimming pool. Half the town said it wasn't a good idea to put the gym floor over the swimming pool. I wonder who turned the key. Probably someone jealous because you chose me to dance with you. <laughs> you think, maybe. Here, let me hold that old wet dress of yours. Hello. Hello. You look at me as if you don't know me. Well, I don't. You've passed me on the street almost every day. Me? Uh-huh. Uh-huh. That was a little girl named Mary Hatch. That wasn't you. Well, do I look as funny as you do? Well, I suppose I'm not quite the football type. <laughs> but you, you look wonderful. If it wasn't me talking, I'd say you were the prettiest girl in town. Well, why don't you say it? I don't know. Maybe I will. How old are you anyways? You can't ask that. Well, I am. Eighteen. Eighteen? Why, it was only last year since you were seventeen. Too young or too old? Oh, no, just right. Your age fits you. I mean, yes, sir, you, you look a little older without clothes on. I mean, without your dress? You look older. I mean, younger. You look just... Oh, I'm sorry. Sir, my train, please. A pox upon me for a clumsy lout. Your, your caboose, m'lady. You may kiss my <coughs> hand. Uh... Mary? As I was lumbering down the street, okay, down then. the street. Okay, I'll throw a rock at the old Granville house. Oh no, George, don't. No, you see, you make a wish, and then you try to break some glass. Gotta be a pretty good shot nowadays, what with all the windows already broken in. Oh, George, I love that old place. It's full of romance. I'd like to live in it. Live in it? Uh-huh. I wouldn't live in it as a ghost. Here, now you see, right up there, second floor. What did you wish for, George? Well, not just one wish, a whole hat full of wishes. I know what I'm going to do today, tomorrow, next year, and the year after that. I'm shaking the dust of this measly, crummy old town off my feet, and I'm going to see the world. I'm going to see Italy, Greece, the Parthenon, the Colosseum. Then... I'm going to go to college and see what they know. After that, I'm going to build things, Mary. I'm going to build airfields. I'm going to build skyscrapers a hundred stories high, bridges a mile long. Say, aren't you going to throw a rock? Hey, that's pretty good. What do you wish for, Mary? Buffalo gals, can't you come out tonight? Can't you come out tonight? Can't you come out tonight? Buffalo gals, can't you come out tonight? And dance by the light of the moon. What'd you wish for when you threw that rock, Mary? Oh, no. Come on, tell me. Well, if I told you, it might not come true. What is it you want, Mary? Here, you want the moon? You just say the word. I'll throw a lasso around it and pull it down for you. Yeah, it's a pretty good idea. I'll give you the moon, Mary. And I'll take it. And then what? Well, then you could swallow it. And it all dissolves, see? And the moonbeams that shoot out of your fingers and your toes and the ends of your hair. <laughs> Say, am I talking too much? Yes, you are! Who's there? Why don't you kiss her instead of talking her to death? What? You know, it's wasted on the wrong people, Ernie. You're telling me. Just wasted! Hey, Bert, Ernie. You come back here. I'll show you some kissing that'll turn your heads round. George, your father's had a stroke. Pop? Mary, I'm sorry, I've got to go. You've got to hurry. But come quick. Did you send for the doctor? Yes, Campbell's there now. There was one virtue my brother never lacked. It was that of decency. Society mocks objections nowadays, but Peter always looked to spread positivity and joy. I'll never forget the memory I have of him. It will stay with me through the good times and the bad. I'll always remember the day my dad walked me home from school in the winter of 13. 
It was freezing, but he wrapped me up with his coat and tied me a little bow with his scarf. We were sneezing for weeks after that. The Duke of Betty was still warm, not in his body, but in his heart, and deep down. And if I could grow up to be just half the man my father was, I'd die happy. My father was the kindest man I ever knew. He truly loved this town and everyone in it. He believed the people deserved something more than just the right to exist. And he wanted everyone to know the safety of a home to call their own. And many of you here have a roof over your heads thanks to my father and his starry-eyed dreams. He was a man of high ideals, yes, but one who would always stop to pass a kind of time of day on the street, no matter how busy he was. He knew every single one of his customers personally, except they weren't just customers to him. They were human beings, they were his friends. My big brother George and I couldn't have asked for anyone better to teach us how to be good men. It was nice of you to come to the funeral, Mr. Potter. Well, I'd say your father was the building and loan here in Bedford Falls, George. I would agree, Mr. Potter. Of course, he wasn't a businessman, and uh, that's what killed him. Oh, I mean, no disrespect. God rest his soul. He was a man of high ideals, so-called. But ideals without common sense can ruin this town. So, at our next Board of Trustees meeting, I am going to make a motion. A motion? That's right. A motion to dissolve the institution and turn its assets and liabilities over to receivership. But, Mr. Potter... Take this loan application the board's to act on this morning to, uh, Ernie Bishop. You know that fellow walks around all day delivering our mail, usually late because he's stopping to talk to everyone on his route. Anyway, I happen to know that the bank refused his loan, and yet he comes to the building and loan, and we're willing to build him a house worth $5,000. Why? Well, I handled that myself, Mr. Potter. You had all his papers there, his salary, his insurance, and I can personally vouch for his character. Oh. He's a friend of yours. Yes, sir. So, if you shoot pool with the manager's son, you get to borrow money. And what does it get the building and loan? A lazy, discontented rabble instead of a thrifty working class. And all because a couple of starry-eyed dreamers like your father stirred him up and filled their heads with a lot of impossible ideas. Now, just a minute. Just a minute, Mr. Potter. You're right when you say my father was no businessman. Why he ever started this penny ante building and loan, I'll never know. But neither you nor anybody else can say anything against his character. His whole life was... Why, in the 25 years since he and Uncle Billy started the institution, he never once thought of himself, never saved any money, but he did help a few people get out of your slums. And what's wrong with that? Just remember, the rabble you're talking about. Well, they do most of the working, and paying, and living, and dying in this town. Well, is it too much to ask to have them work, and pay, and live, and die in a couple of decent rooms and a bath? My father didn't think so. To him, people were human beings. But to you, a warped, frustrated old man, they're cattle. Well, in my books, my father died a much richer man than you'll ever be. I'm not interested in your young man. I'm talking about the building and the I know very well what you're talking about, Mr. Potter. You're talking about something that you can't get your fingers on. And oh, it's galling you. Well, thank you for your time, Mr. Potter. I'll see you at the meeting. You're not on the board. I hold my father's proxy so I can attend and cast a vote. You see, the way I look at it, this town needs my family's one-horse institution. If only they have some place to go without crawling to you. Get out of here! Sentimental hogwash. 
I'm still going to make my motion, young man. And we'll see who has the power in this town. But you spoke eloquently at the board meeting that day, and they voted Potter down. Remember? Well, on one condition, I hadn't banked on that you take your father's place. And you did. You turned over all your college money and sent Harry off to college. He became a football star. You know, he made second team All-American. That's right. And you, you got four years older. Then, one night, you decided to go over to Mary Hatch's house and bumped into Violet on the way. Well, hello, Georgie Porgy. Oh, hello, Vi. How's business down at the old-fashioned permanent wave shop? Not a tidal wave yet, but I'm getting some city mothers in, thanks to you. What gifts with you? Nothing. Where are you going? I'll probably just end up down at the library. <sighs> Georgie, don't you get tired of reading about things? Yeah. Yeah, I do. Say, what are you doing tonight? Not a thing. Well, are you game, Vi? Let's make a night of it. I love it, Georgie. What do we do? Well, we could walk through the fields and take off our shoes and feel the grass. Huh? And then we could climb Mount Bedford up to the falls and we'll, we'll smell the pines and watch the sunrise against the peaks. Say, we'll spend the whole night up there and everybody will talk about it and it'll be a terrific scandal. Walk in the grass in my bare feet, George. Have you gone crazy? And Mount Bedford, who would want to walk all the way up to Mount Bedford? It's got to be a 10 mile hike at least. Get the hell. It was just a damn crazy idea, right? You're telling me. Good night, George. Well, hello there. Hello, Mary. Why, well, I, I just happened to be passing by and. Have you made up your mind? How's that? Have you made up your mind? About what? About paying a visit. Your mother phoned and said you're on your way over. My mother called you? How did she know? Didn't you tell her? No, I didn't tell anybody. I just went for a walk and happened to be passing by. Well, do you want to come up on the porch and sit a minute? Maybe for a minute. But I didn't tell anybody I was coming over. Say, when did you get back? Tuesday. Where did you get that dress? <laughs> do you like it? It's okay, I guess. I thought you'd go back to New York with Sam and Inji and the rest of them. Oh, well, I worked there a few vacations, but I don't know, I guess I was homesick. Homesick? For Bedford Falls? Yes, and my family and everything. Aren't you coming back up on the porch? Well, maybe for just a minute. But I want you to know, I didn't tell anybody I was coming over. Would you rather leave? No. I mean, I wouldn't about to be rude. Well... Buffalo girls, can't you come out tonight? Can't you come out tonight? Can't you come out tonight? Buffalo girls, can't you come out tonight? And dance Mary. by the light of... Mary? Who's down there with you? It's George Bailey, mother. George Bailey? What does he want? I don't know. What do you want? Me? Not a thing. He's making violent love to me, mother. You tell him to go right back home and don't you leave the house either. Sam Wainwright promised to call you from New York tonight. There he is now. Good night, George. I'd better be going. No, wait a minute. Mary, get the phone. Hello? Sam, how are you? You'll never guess who's here. It's George Bailey. George, Sam's on the phone. He wants to talk to you. Me? Yeah, hurry, it's a long distance. Hello? Sam? Well, George Bailiofsky, hey, a fine pal you are. What are you trying to do, steal my girl? What do you mean? Nobody's trying to steal your girl. Here, here's Mary. No, wait a minute, wait a minute. I want to talk to the both of you. Tell Mary to get on the extension. I have a big deal coming up that's going to make us all rich. Hey, George, you remember that night in Martini's bar when you told me something about making plastics out of soybeans? Uh, yeah, yeah. Soybean, sure. Well, Dad snapped up the idea. He's going to build a factory outside of Rochester. And here's the point. Mary, Mary, you're in on this too. Now, George, have you got any money? 
Money? Yeah, a little bit. Now listen up. I want you to put every cent you've got into our stocks. You hear? And I may have a job for you. That is, unless you're still married to that broken down building and loan. This is the biggest thing since radio, and I'm letting you in on the ground floor. Mary? Mary? Uh, I'm here. Would you tell that guy I'm giving him the chance of a lifetime? You hear? The chance of a lifetime. He says it's the chance of a lifetime. No. No. I don't want any plastics. And I don't want any ground floors. And I don't want to get married. Ever. To anyone. I want to do what I want to do. And you're... Oh, Mary. Mary. George. George. <laughs> Bert and I chipped in on this and, well, we'll hope you float away to happy land on bubbles. <laughs> hey, look at that. Champagne. Oh, thank you, Ernie. Oh, and by the way, where are you two going on this here now honeymoon? Where are we going? Well, there's a kitty. Go on, count it, Mary. Oh, my. I feel like a bootlegger's wife. <laughs> <laughs> look. What are we going to do? I tell you, we're going to shoot the works. A whole week in New York. A whole week in Bermuda. The highest hotels. The oldest champagne, the richest caviar, and the hottest music. And of course, the prettiest wise. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know what? That does it. And um, then what? Well, then what, honey? After that, who cares? <laughs> that does it. Come here. <laughs> I'd hate to break anything up, but... There's something funny going on down in the bank. I've never really seen one, but it has all the earmarks of a, of a run. Oh, run. Oh, my. If you got any money in the bank, folks, you better hurry. Um, you ain't here, Mary. I'll be just a minute. George, let's not go. Please, let's stay. Well, I'll be back in a minute, Mary. What's the meaning of this, Uncle Billy? A holiday? This is a pickle, George. It's a real pickle. All right, now, what happened? How did it start? How does anything like this ever start? All I know is that the bank called our loan. When? About an hour ago. They took all our cash. All of it? Every cent. It was still less than we owe. Oh, holy mackerel. The whole town's gone crazy. <laughs> Mr. Potter. So what do we owe this unexpected visit? George, there's a rumor around town that you're going to close your doors early. Is that true? It's not for another 10 minutes. That's our regular closing time. Well, I'm glad to hear that. George, are you all right? Do you want me to call the sheriff? What for? Well, mobs get... Pretty ugly sometimes, you know. <laughs> now, I can assure you, Mr. Potter, all of our customers are very polite. I'm sure. George, I'm going all out to help in this crisis. I've just guaranteed the bank sufficient funds to meet their needs. They'll close down for a week and then uh, reopen. You've taken over the bank? I may lose a fortune, but... I'm willing to guarantee your people, too. Just bring your shares on over to the bank and I will pay you 50 cents on the dollar. Now, I'm sure that won't be necessary. We'll take care of our customers right here. Well, just make sure you don't close your doors before 6 p.m. or you'll never reopen. Ladies, gentlemen, remember, 50 cents on the dollar. You never miss a trick, do you, Potter? Well, you're gonna miss this one. Now, don't panic, folks. You heard, Mr. Potter. The bank will open in a week. But I've got money here, George Bailey, and I want it now. No, oh, Mr. Andrews. You're thinking of this place all wrong. As if I had the money back there in the safe. Your money's not here. Your money's in the Granger's house, right next to yours. And the Kennedys, and the Macklins, and a hundred others. Why, you lend them the money to build, and then they'll pay it back to you as best they can. Now what are you going to do? Fall clothes on them? But I've got $242 here, George Bailey. All right, Mr. Andrews. 
You sign this, you'll get your money in 60 days. That's 60 days! Now that's what you agreed to when you bought your shares. Now stick to your original agreement here, Mr. Andrews. Please, give us 60 days on this. Are you gonna go to Potter's? Better half than nothing, right? Mr. Yeah. Andrews, Mr. Thompson, wait. Now just a minute, listen to me on this. If Potter gets hold of this building and loan, there'll never be another decent house built in this town. Why, he's already got charge of the bank. He's got the bus line. Heck, he's got the department stores. And now, he's after us. Why? Because we're cutting in on his business. And because he wants to keep you living in his slums. Paying the kind of rent he decides. Well, we can't let him. We can get through this. But we've got to stick together, folks. We've got to have faith in each other. I've not worked in over a year. I've got doctor's bills to pay. I need the money now. Yeah. George, we need cash. I can't feed my kids on faith. Well, how much do you need? Hey, that's right. You've got $2,000. That's perfect! Here's $2,000. This'll tide us over till the bank reopens. All right, Mr. Andrews, how much do you need? $242. Come on, Mr. Andrews. Just enough to the I'll bank I'll take my $242, George. Well, there you are. And that'll close my account. No, your account's still here. That's a loan. Okay, all right, now Ernie. I've got $300 here, George. Come on, Ernie. How much do you need till the bank reopens? I suppose $20. $20? Now you're talking. All right, thanks, Ernie. Okay, all right, uh, Mr. Thompson. But that's your money, George. Never mind about that. How much do you need? I suppose $20. $20. And I'll sign a paper. You don't have to sign anything. I know you'll pay it back when you can. That's okay. All right, who's next? Can I take the 1750? Seven? Bless your heart. Say, do you got the 50 cents? Come on, Uncle Billy. You take over. I think we're going to make it, George. I think we're going to make it. So do I. Well, hello, Mrs. Bailey. Hello, Mr. Bailey. How's business? Booming. Well? At least you have a place to come home to. I mean, a few of the windows are broken in, and there are some leaks in the ceiling. But the structure is sound, and there's not a crack in the foundation. What are you talking about? 32 Sycamore. 32 Sycamore? But that's... Remember the night we broke the windows? Well, that's what I wished for, and I've been saving ever since. Happy anniversary. Happy anniversary? You've only been married an hour. One hour, 30 minutes, and 40-odd seconds to be exact. Soon enough to celebrate, I would say. Oh, darling, you're wonderful. Four, five, six! We made it, George! We're doing business! And we've got two bad notes left! Well, pop the champagne. I'd say we were a couple of financial wizards. Those Rockefellers! Now open the safe for these great, big, important simoleons. I think we should save them for seed. Well, here's to Papa Dollar, and here's to Mama Dollar. And if you want the building and loan to stay in business, you'd better have a family. Real quick. I wish they were rabbits. <laughs> hey, that's great, Mary. You hear that, Uncle Billy? Rabbits. Well, here's to rabbits. Rabbits! We hope you enjoyed Act One of the show. It's now time to take a short break. The interval will run for 10 minutes, during which we will hear a selection of popular 1940s songs performed by Josh Kay. We will also be broadcasting a short film, delivered by the cast, exploring what we think constitutes a wonderful life. Can we remind you all about the Parents Association Raffle, information about which will be appearing on your screen at the end of the interval before the show resumes. See you all after the break. Gonna take a sentimental journey Gonna set my heart at ease Gonna make a sentimental journey To renew old memories Got my bag, I got my reservation Spent each dime I could afford like a child in wild anticipation Long to hear that all aboard Seven, that's the time we leave at Seven, 
I'll be waiting up for heaven Counting every mile of railroad track That takes me back Never thought my heart could be so yearning Why did I decide to roam? Gotta take the sentimental journey Sentimental journey home Gonna take a sentimental journey Gonna set my heart at ease Gonna make a sentimental journey To renew old memories Got my bag, I got my reservation Spent each time I could afford Like a child in wild anticipation Long to hear that all aboard Seven, that's the time we leave at Seven, I'll be waiting up for heaven Counting every mile of railroad track That takes me back Never thought my heart could be so yearning Why did I decide to roam? Gotta take the sentimental journey Sentimental journey home Must remember this A kiss is still a kiss A sigh is just a sigh The fundamental things apply As time goes by And when two lovers woo They still say I love you on that you can rely No matter what the future brings As time goes by Moonlight and love songs Never out of date Hearts full of Passion, jealousy and hate Woman needs man and man must have his mate That no one can deny It's still the same old story A fight for love and glory A case of do or die the world will always welcome lovers as time goes by. You must remember this, a kiss is still a kiss, a sigh is just a sigh. The fundamental things apply as time goes by And when two lovers woo, they still say I love you On that you can rely No matter what the future brings as time goes by Moonlight and love songs never out of date Hearts full of passion, jealousy and hate 
woman needs man, and man must have his mates that no one can deny. It's still the same old story, a fight for love and glory, a case of do or die. The world will always welcome lovers as time goes by. Means having a family and friends you can laugh along with. Um, just having uh, family, friends, we're all in good health, uh, your own good health, um, enjoying the experiences of life and being content with what you've got. A wonderful life is everyone with a happy family and a joyous lives together. Having family and friends and making them feel better. A wonderful life is having constant support from friends and family, especially when times are tough. To me, a wonderful life is family and friends, especially at the moment during this really hard time. A key ingredient to a wonderful life is having friends and family to support and care for you. So what a wonderful life means to me is caring for the people around you, being surrounded by people that care for you, and um, setting your own goals to achieve them. Uh, a wonderful life is to have great experiences and live with no regrets. So I think uh, living a wonderful life is, you know, leaving a better world for the people you leave behind. A wonderful life means leaving a legacy that people will remember. I think a wonderful life is when you surround yourself with the right people and don't start giving in to the wrong people. I believe a wonderful life involves um, leaving a legacy and leaving a positive impact, making a change in the world. I think a wonderful life is based on companionship and community. To me, a wonderful life stems from finding appreciation in all the small things that we take for granted. To me, a wonderful life is to make a change, um, and that doesn't have to be something massive, um, that can just be making someone's day better, just improving someone else's life just that little bit. I think that a wonderful life is one where you find value in the things that you have rather than what anybody else thinks has value. A wonderful life is a life that has helped as many other lives as possible.
You can't ignore this Bailey's Park for any longer, Mr. Potter. It's cutting deeper and deeper into your rental profits. The Bailey family has been a boil on my neck long enough. Uh, speaking of which, sir, there's a uh, Mr. Bailey here to see you now. Good. Tell him to wait. Go on. Uh, as I was saying, they've built up a whole subdivision near the cemetery. Uh, so dozens and dozens of the prettiest little houses you ever saw. You know, I'm seriously thinking of buying one myself. Don't you dare. All I'm saying is, uh, you need to be more careful. Uh, you know, if I were you... You are not me. As I say, I'm just a humble bank examiner. Uh, but now I'm a busy man, Mr. Carter. I don't have time for idle conjecture. Good day. Cut into my revenue, will you? Well, I'll show you a trick or two, Mr. Bailey. Send him in. Yes, sir. Uh, Mr. Bailey, Mr. Potter will see you now. Thank you. George, so good to see you again. Well, Mr. Potter, this is quite the unusual request. What's that? You're calling to ask me to pay you a visit. I don't know what's so unusual about it. I just thought the two of us should get uh, better acquainted. Here, have a cigar. Well, thank you. Say, this is quite the cigar. You like it? I'll send you a box. Well, I suppose I'll find out sooner or later. But just what exactly do you want to speak to me about? <laughs> That's what I like so much about you. George, I'm an old man. And most people hate me, <laughs> but I don't like them either, so that makes it all about even. You know, just as I do, that I run practically everything in this town. But the Bailey Building and Loan. You know also that for a number of years I have been trying to get control of it. Or kill it. But I haven't been able to do it. You have been stopping me. In fact, you have beaten me, George, and as anyone in this county will tell you, that takes some doing. Take the Depression, for instance. You and I were the only ones who kept our heads. You saved the building and loan, and uh, I saved all the rest. Yes, well, most people say you stole all the rest, but... The envious ones say that, George. The suckers. But I have stated my side very frankly. Let's look at your side. A young man, 27, 28, married, making, say, uh, 40 a week. 45. 45. 45. Out of which, after supporting your wife and your mother and paying your bills, you get to keep, say, uh, Ten, if you skimp. A child or two comes along and you won't even be able to save the ten. Now, if this 28-year-old was a common, ordinary yokel, I'd say he's doing fine. But George Bailey is no common, ordinary yokel. He is an intelligent, smart, ambitious young man who hates his job, who hates the building and loan almost as much as I do. A young man who's been dying to get out on his own ever since he was born. A young man, the smartest one in the crowd, mind you. A young man who's had to sit by and watch his friends go places because he was trapped. Yes, sir, trapped into frittering his life away playing nursemaid to a lot of garlic eaters. Do I paint an accurate picture or do I exaggerate? Now what's your point, Mr. Potter? My point? My point is I want to hire you. Hire me? I want you to manage my affairs, run my properties. George, I'll start you out at $20,000 a year. Twenty, twenty thousand dollars $20,000? You wouldn't mind living in the nicest house in town. Buying your wife a lot of fine clothes. Couple of business trips to New York a year, maybe. Once in a while, Europe. You wouldn't mind that, would you, George? Would I? 
You're not talking to somebody else here. You know this is me. You remember me, George Bailey. Oh, yes, George Bailey, whose ship has just come in, providing he has the brains enough to climb aboard. Well, what about the building and loan? Confound it, man. Are you afraid of success? I'm offering you a three-year contract starting out at $20,000 a year. Is it a deal or isn't it? Look, I know I ought to jump at the chance. Really, I do. But I was wondering if you could just give me 24 hours on this. Sure, sure. You go on home and talk it over with your wife. Yeah, I think I'd like to do that. In the meantime, I'll draw up the papers. All right, sir. Okay, George. Okay, Mr. Potter. No. No, no. I don't have to talk to anybody. I know the answer right now. And the answer is no, doggone it. No. You sit here and you spin your little webs and you think the whole world revolves around you and your money. Well, it doesn't. In the whole vast configuration of things, I'd say you are nothing but a scurvy little spider. You, and that goes for you too. And then you went home and found out that Mary was expecting. You forgot all about Potter. You were on top of the world then, George Bailey. Couldn't have been happier. Well, that was nearly 10 years ago. We've been through a war since then. Yes. And your wife has given birth to not one, but four beautiful children. And your brother, Harry, has been decorated with the Congressional Medal of Honor. President decorates Harry Bailey. That was the headline in all of this morning's newspapers. That's right. This morning, 10 a.m., day before Christmas. That's when it all started, wasn't it? Remember you were out buying a Christmas wreath? And Uncle Billy... Uncle Billy was on his way to the bank. Extra, extra, read all about it. Local boy wins Congressional Medal of Honor. Harry Bailey to be decorated by President. Here, give me one. One of those Bailey boys again. Oh, hello, Mr. Potter. What's the news? Harry Bailey wins Congressional Medal. Say, that could be one of those Bailey boys, could it? You just can't keep them down at the moment, can you? And how does Slacker do Oh, Slacker, boy. He's very jealous. Very jealous indeed. He only lost that uh, three buttons off his jacket. Mind you, Mr. Potter, if Slacker George could have gone, he'd have got two of those medals. And he has that. That's right. But you see, not every field could be in Germany or Japan. Give me back my paper! Buy it! Wait a minute. Hey! Take me straight to the bank. Extra, extra, read all about it. George, Harry's on the phone, long distance, Washington. Harry? Well, what do you know about that? He's reversed the charges. It's okay, isn't it? Is it okay? For a hero, of course. Hello? Harry? Oh, you old seven kinds of a son of a gun. Congratulations. Mm-hmm. And how's Mother standing it? She did? Well, what do you know about that? Mother had lunch with the president's wife. Oh, wait till Uncle Billy hears about this. Mm-hmm. Yeah. George? Seven George, ten. Violet's here. Oh, hello, Vi. George, can I see you for a second? Sure. Just step into my office. I'll be just a minute. I'm going to have to go now, Harry, but uh, I'll pass you over to Uncle Billy. See you soon. 
Hurry, Uncle Billy, long distance, Washington. I can't speak to anyone at the moment. But, Uncle Billy, it's Harry, your nephew, remember? I'll pass you on to your Uncle Billy, Harry. Hello? Hello, Harry. Uh, yeah, everything's fine. Everything's fine. Character. If I had any character, Look, I'd... Now it takes a lot of character to leave your hometown and start all over again. No, George, don't. Here, now you're broke, aren't you? I know, but... Look, what do you want to do? Huck your furs in that hat? You want to walk to New York? You know, they charge for meals and rent just the same as they do in Bedford Falls. Yeah, sure. Look, take it. It's a loan. That's my business. Building and loan. Besides, you'll get a job anyway. Good luck to you. I'm glad I know you, George Bailey. Say hello to New York for me. Yeah, sure I will. And let's hear from you. Say, what's the matter? <clears throat> Merry Christmas, Vi. Merry Christmas, George. George, can I speak to you for a moment? Uncle Billy? What is it? I, um... I lost the 8,000. What? Is that your bad ear? No. Then you did hear me. I'm afraid so. How much? 8,000. That much? And are you sure you didn't buy anything? No, nothing. Not even a stick of gum. Well, are you sure you had the money with you? Um, I was counting it, so I think so. You think? Come on, Uncle Billy, we've got to find that money. I'm no good to you, George. Look, um, do you have any secret hiding places you could have put it? Somewhere, somewhere to put the money, somewhere to hide it? Uh, no, nothing like that. Look, listen to me. Just listen to me. Think. Yeah, I have think. been thinking. I can't think anymore. It hurts. Look, listen to me. Where's the money? You silly, stupid, old fool. Where's that money? Do you realize what this means? This means bankruptcy and scandal and prison. No, no, no. Yes, that's what it means. It means one of us is going to jail. Well, it's not going to be me. Hello, darling. Hello, Daddy. Merry Christmas, Daddy. Merry Christmas. How do you like it? Bless you. Well, did you bring the wreath? Daddy, did you bring the Christmas wreath? Wreath? What wreath? The Christmas wreath for the window. No, I left it back at the office. Is it snowing? Yeah, it's just started. Where's your coat and hat? I left them at the office, too. George, what's the matter? Nothing. Everything's all right. Well, isn't it wonderful about Harry? I'll bet I had 50 calls today about the parade and the banquet. Your mother's so excited. Daddy, the brown's next door have a new car. You should see it. What's the matter with our car? Isn't it good enough for you? Yes, Daddy. George, you better go and shave now. The families will be here soon. Families? I don't want any families over here. <coughs> now, what's the matter with you? Oh, it's just a cold. He caught it coming home from school today. He won a prize for his Christmas costume and didn't want to button his coat. Have you got a soft throat or what? Just, just a cold. The doctor says he'll be all right. The doctor? Is the doctor here? Well, yeah, I called him right away. But he says it's nothing serious. Well, have you got a temperature, son? Uh, I don't think so. Just a little one. 99.6. But he'll be fine. Well, you better get back upstairs. This floor is cold. But it's Christmas Eve. Now! I'll be up in a minute. It's this old house. I don't know why we don't all have pneumonia. This drafty old barn. Might as well be living in a refrigerator. I mean, why do we have to stay in this measly, crummy old town anyway? George, what's wrong? Daddy, how'd you spell frankincense? How should I know? Ask your mother. Hello. I'll get it. Hello, Mrs. Welsh? Yes, this is Mrs. Bailey. How are you? Oh no, he'll be fine. The doctor says he'll be out of bed in time for his Christmas dinner. Hey, is that Tommy's teacher? Yeah? Here, let me speak to her. Hello? Mrs. Welch? Yeah, this is George Bailey, Tommy's father. Say, what kind of a teacher are you anyways, sending him home half-naked without a coat on? 
Don't you realize you'll probably catch pneumonia on account of you? George. Say, what are we paying our taxes for? Silly, stupid teachers like you, sending our children home without any clothes on? Oh, that's stupid. Hello? Mrs. Welsh, I want to apologize. Hello? She's hung up. I'll hang her up. I'll get it. Hello? Ah, Mr. Welch. So glad you called. Gives me a chance to tell you what I really think of your wife. Oh, you do, huh? Well, any time you think you're man enough, you just... I hung up. Jenny, how do you spell hallelujah? How should I know? What do you think I am? A dictionary? God, I've got to get out of this place. I'm in trouble, Mr. Potter. I need help. Through some sort of an accident, my company's short in their accounts. The bank examiner is in town today, and I need to raise $8,000 immediately. So that's what the reporters wanted to talk to you about. The reporters? Yes. They called me up from your building and loan. Oh, and there's a man from the DA's office there, too. He's looking for you. Oh, you've, you've got to help me, Mr. Potter. Won't you help me, please? Can't you see what this means to my family? I'll George, give you, I'll... is it possible there's some slight discrepancy in the books? No, there's nothing wrong with the books, sir. I've just managed to misplace $8,000. I can't find it anywhere. You've misplaced $8,000? Yes, sir. Have you notified the police? No, sir. I didn't want the publicity. I mean... It's Harry's homecoming tomorrow, and... <laughs> They'll believe that one. What have you been up to, George? Playing the market with the company's money? No, sir. No, I haven't. What is it, then? A woman? Everyone in town knows you've been giving money to Violet Peterson. What? Not that it matters to me, but... Uh, why'd you come to me? Why didn't you go to Sam Wainwright and ask him for the money? He's in Europe. I, I can't get a hold of him. Well, what about all your other friends? They don't have that kind of money, Mr. Potter, and you know that. You're the only one in town who can help me. I see. I've suddenly become quite important. And what kind of security would I have, George? Have you any stocks? No, sir. Bonds, real estate, collateral of any kind? Well, I've got a $15,000 life insurance policy. Yes, but how much is your equity in it? Five hundred dollars. Look at you. You used to be so cocky. You were gonna go out and conquer the world. You once called me a warped, frustrated old man. What are you but a warped, frustrated young man? A miserable little clock crawling in here on your hands and knees and begging for help. Why don't you go to the riffraff you love so much and ask them to let you have $8,000? You know why? Because they'd run you out of town on a rail. But I'll tell you what I'm going to do for you, George. Since the state examiner is still here and as a stockholder of the building and loan, I am going to swear out a warrant for your arrest. No. Misappropriation of funds, no. manipulation, no. malfeasance. No, sir, please. Go ahead then, George. You can't hide in a little town like this. Oh, God. You've got to help me out here. We wish you a Merry Christmas. We wish you a Merry Christmas. We, we wish you a Merry Christmas, Christmas and a Happy New Year. George? George Bailey? Is that you? Come on and join us. Not tonight, Mr. Marty. Wait a minute. Did he call you George Bailey? That's right. This is Mr. George Bailey brother of the young man who's just won the Congressional Medal of Honor. You! You've talked to my wife like that again. She cried for an hour and wouldn't even come out with us tonight. Hey, that's enough, Mr. Walsh, that's enough. Isn't it enough? She's slaves teaching your stupid kids how to read and write. You have to ball her out. Mr. Welsh! Oh, to hell with it. I'm going home. 
Come on, everybody. It's Christmas Eve. We're supposed to be spreading good cheer. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I'm gonna sing anymore. We wish you a Merry Christmas. We wish you a Merry Christmas. We wish you a Merry Christmas. Hey, George. Are you all right? Sure. Do you want me to take you home? Oh, I'll be fine. I'm waiting for someone. Go on with your friends. Are you sure? Where's my insurance policy? What do you say? Nothing, please. Er Ernie, are you coming? Yeah, I'll be right there. Are you sure you'll be all right, George? I'm sure. Thanks, Ernie. Well then, Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas, Ernie. God, God, dear Father in heaven, I'm not a praying man, but if you're up there and you can hear me, show me the way. I'm at the end of my rope. Show me the way, God. And that's where I came in. You mean you actually heard my prayers up there? <laughs> Yours and over a dozen others. You'd be surprised how many people are concerned about you. Not after they find out that I've ruined their lives. You haven't ruined their lives, George. Besides, it wasn't your fault. Look, I'm the president of the company. I'm the one to be held accountable. Just ask Mr. Potter. He'll tell you. And you think that killing yourself will make everyone feel happier? I don't know. I suppose it'd be better if I'd never been born at all. What did you say? I said, I wish I'd never been born. Now, you mustn't say things like that. Just wait a minute. Wait a minute. That's an idea. What do you think? Yeah, that'll do it. All right. You've never been born. You've never been born. What did you say? You've never been born. You don't exist. No worries, no obligations, no $8,000 to get, no Potter looking for you with the sheriff. Say something again into that ear. Sure. You can hear out of it. That's the darndest thing. I haven't heard out of that age since I was a kid. What's going on? Merry Christmas! Hey, who's that sucker over there? Come on, let's sing to him. We wish you a Merry Christmas. We wish you a Merry Christmas. We wish you a Merry Christmas. <laughs> Dominic? <laughs> That's my name, and this is my poison. You want some? Mr. Martini, don't you recognize me? <laughs> Dominic, you know your name. Now we've got to sing. <laughs> we, we wish you a Merry Christmas. Where's your wife? Where's Mrs. Martini? They're at home. They're all at home. And that's what makes it a very Merry Christmas. Well, I saw them just a minute ago. Her and a load of other women and children, too. Where? What are you talking about? You're not about to snitch on us, are you? Wait a minute. I know you. You ran at me just a minute ago. Did I? Did you hear that? Here, let me try again. Hey, look, here's that panhandler. Hey, why don't you got a dime or two you could spare? Or a drink. I'd settle for a drink. Mr. Gower, it's me, George. Don't you remember me? Come on, I don't like messing around with this guy. 
You own the corner drugstore. I worked for you when I was a kid. Now I know I don't like you. That room had spent 20 years in jail for poisoning a kid. That's right. And if you know him, you must be a jailbird yourself. Come on, man. Let's get out of here. Hey, wait a minute. Wait for me. Wait for me. You see, George, you were not there to stop Gower from putting that poison into the... What do you mean, not there? I remember distinctly. Look, who are you? I told you, George. I'm your guardian angel. But I don't get it. But it's what you asked for, what you wanted. Don't you see? It's all because you were not born. Not born? That's right. But if I wasn't born, then who am I? You're nobody. You have no identity. What do you mean, no identity? I'm George Bailey. I was born July 12th, 1907, right here in Bedford Falls. You'll find no public record of it. Besides, this isn't Bedford Falls anymore. It's Pottersville. Pottersville? No. No. I'm afraid so. And there is no George Bailey. Never has been. You see, George, you've been given a great gift. A chance to see what the world would be like without you. That's what they call me. Oh, am I glad to see you. Well, I'm glad to see you too. And you in town? Who gave you my name? It's me, George. Of course you are. And if anyone asks me, I've never seen or heard of you before. But you have. It's me, George Bailey. We grew up together. I don't think so good looking, but I sure wish we had. Well, Violet, you've got to remember. Well, I've got all night. Why don't you tell me about it? Look, you're Violet Peterson. You were born in 1910. No, wait, 1911. And you graduated right here from the local high school. Wait a minute, what are you? Some sort of private eye? I should have known. Don't you guys ever give it a rest this Christmas Eve, for God's sakes? No, Violet, you don't understand. Oh, yes, I do. Well, see no evil, hear no evil, speak no evil. That's my motto. So give it a rest and get out of here. Violet. Or I'll make a telephone call. George, or whatever your name is, and I don't think you want me to do that. Merry Christmas. What's going on here? Where's Harry? I want to see my little brother. Harry Bailey broke through the ice and was drowned at the age of nine. Strange, isn't it? One man's life touches the lives of so many others, and when he isn't around, he leaves an awful hole, doesn't he? But he saved the lives of all the men on that transport. It was headlines in all the newspapers. Every man on that transport died. Harry wasn't there to save them because you weren't there to save Harry. You see, George, you really had a wonderful life. Don't you see what a mistake it would be to throw it all away? Clarence? Yes, George? 
Where's Mary? Oh, well, I don't think... Look, if you know where she is, just tell me. You're not going to like it, George. Where's Mary? Is she alive? Yes, she's alive, and she never married, but she's not like the Mary you know. Something happened. Mary? There's got to be some easier way for me to get my wings. Mary. Who are you? What do you want? It's me. George, don't you know me? Get away from me. I'll scream. Mary, what happened to us? I don't know what you're talking about. It's me. I'm George. Your husband, George. <laughs> no. Get away from me. Help. Somebody, help. Mary. Mary. Clarence. Clarence, help me, Clarence. Get me back. Get me back. I don't care what happens to me. Only get me back to my wife and to my kids. I... Help me, Clarence. Help me. I want to live again. Hey, George. George! Are you all right? I didn't do anything to her. Honest. What are you talking about? What did the Sam Hill are you yelling for, George? Don't... George? Bert, do you know me? Know you? Are you kidding? I've been looking all over town for you. Half the town's out looking for you. Mary! Mary! Oh, yeah. Mary called. So did Martini. Oh, and your Uncle Billy. And even your mother called. So what is going on, George? What's going on? Why, look around you. It's moving. It's breathing. It's alive. Merry Christmas, Bert. I think I'd better take you home. No, I'll be fine. Honestly, I'll be fine. Mary? Well, hello, Mr. Bank Examiner. Uh, ah, yes, Mr. Bailey. This is still the uh, small matter of your account that we have to discuss? Yes. Isn't it wonderful? Merry Christmas. Now, Mary, Mary. Oh, look at this wonderful drafty barn. Now, where's Mary? Say, do you see my wife? Daddy! Merry Christmas. Oh, look at you Merry wonderful Christmas, kids. Dad. I could just eat you up. But where's your mother? She went looking for you at Uncle Billy. George? George! Hallelujah! Oh, goodness. Let me... Where have you been? You're real. Oh, what happened? You have no idea what happened. You have no idea what happened. Come on, right here now. They're coming now, George. I can hear them. It's a miracle. A miracle. They just said, if George is in trouble, count on me. Honestly, you've never seen anything like it. <laughs> what is this, George? Another run on the bank? <laughs> <laughs> I wouldn't have a roof over my head if it weren't for you, George Bailey. Anything for you, George. Any time for you, George. I made the rounds for my charge accounts, George. I'm not going to go, George. I changed my mind. Hey! Hey, quiet, everybody. Quiet, quiet. Now, this is from London. Mr. Gower Cables. You need cash. Stop. My office has instructed me to advance you up to twenty-five thousand dollars. Twenty-five thousand. Merry Christmas from Sam Wainwright. Hey. hey. For just in time to my big brother George, the richest man in town. The, the richest, richest man, man in town. town! Wait a minute, wait a minute, I almost forgot. Some crazy little old man handed me this at the airport. Maybe he promised to give it to you personally. Tom Sawyer? Who would give you a beat-up copy of Tom Sawyer? Dear George, remember, no man is a failure who has friends. Thanks for the wings. Love, Clarence, a Christmas present from a very dear friend of mine, just like all of you. Merry Christmas, everybody. Merry, Merry Christmas. Christmas. Listen, Dad. What's that, son? Hear the bell? Teacher says every time a bell rings, an angel gets his wings. <laughs> That's right. That's right. 
Attaboy, Clarence. Come on, everyone. For Remember, no man is a failure who has friends. So with that, a very Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year.